Hello and welcome to the wonderful world of electronics. Thanks for joining this video lecture series. If you're returning and have not yet subscribed, I encourage you to subscribe. If you're coming here for the first time, you may need to watch the preceding lectures as they tend to follow from one another. Now, there was a number of issues that I did not address in the last lecture, uh, which I'm going to postpone until a future lecture because I need to kick off the semiconductor lecture with some introduction. So we will return to the missing aspects of capacitors and coils. That was a very long lecture. The last lecture was, and I want to keep this one short. Okay. So let's deal with the diodes first. Diode has a single junction between the N and P type doped material. You can watch plenty of videos on the internet that will give you all the physical um, information about how the diodes are structured and produced and all the rest of it. But uh, the purpose of the electronic part is what we are concerned with in this video. And it was originally designed to act as a one-way only conductor. That was what the first diodes did. However, in 2018, with all the focus on renewable energy and energy reduction and all the rest of it, the light emitting diode has become very important as an efficient source of general illumination. And therefore, this one way conduction aspect is not relevant in this particular application when the diodes are being used to uh, replace normal incandescent and fluorescent bulbs, they're not being strictly used in the diode way. They may have diode properties, but they're not serving the diode function in electronic circuits. Other uses of specialized diodes that have been constructed in addition to LEDs are Zener diodes, which are used for voltage regulation. We're not going to look at them. That's not a beginner topic. And frequency control, which uses a Veracta diode, which is highly modified so that it acts as a capacitor and uh, the BIOS varies the capacitive effect. But this is not introductory material. We want to get you into projects, building circuits as soon as possible. So let's examine the diode. First of all, the symbols. Uh, you see that the symbol is an arrow. The arrow shows the direction of current flow. Current does not flow in the other direction to the arrow. Now notice that the physical appearance of these items is also shown. A single physical LED uh, looks as shown. It has the, it radiates the light from the curved end and it has the two leads at the bottom. A normal diode for use in electronic circuits looks similar to a resistor. It's just a long cylindrical object with two leads, one at either end. Please note the band there uh, indicates which end is the cathode because the two ends are not identical and we need to distinguish between one end and the other. This does not apply to resistors. We can put in the resistors any way we like. It has no unique configuration. Now, how do we know the unique configuration with the LED? It has a flat spot next to the cathode leg. Looking there on the right. So you have a way to tell which leg is the cathode. Now, why do we need to know the difference between the cathode and the anode? Because of the operation of it. When the anode is more positive than the cathode, current will flow. When the anode is negative with respect to the cathode, current will not flow. And if it's an LED, if current flows, you get light. If no current flows, you get no light. All right, so if the cathode end is more positive than the, the anode end, 
then we say that the uh, diode is reverse biased. Okay, so let's learn this terminology. A reverse, bias, reverse biased diode is not conducting electricity and a forward biased diode is. So there we show a forward biased diode and uh, we tell you about it. But basically, notice I have 0.7 volts written next to the symbol. When the diode is forward biased and current is flowing through it, there will always be a constant voltage across the part of 0.7 volts. This is so different to a resistor where the voltage depends entirely on the current flowing through it. Here we're always getting 0.7 volts no matter what current is flowing. So obviously diodes do not obey Ohm's law. We come now to the transistor. A bipolar transistor contains two junctions, one forward bias and the other reversed bias. So we could sort of draw this as two separate diodes, but we wouldn't get the right behavior out of it because the sum is more than the parts. It does not behave like two connected diodes, which is what we're going to draw now. Here we have two connected diodes, one forward biased and the other reverse biased, as you can see. And we have the transistor drawn on the right hand side. And you can see that I have a do not equal sign between them because we do not get the same result. Notice in the middle diagram that the NPN material is connected all together, connected all together, whereas if we have two uh, diodes back to back like that with a, a wire connection between the two independent diodes, we actually have two pieces of P material connected with a wire. We don't have a continuous piece of P material as we do. And of course I have shown and indicated the junction between the P and the N material. So that is the symbol for the transistor there on the right hand side. And where I have those two plus signs, it merely means that the collector is more positive than the base. The, we have the emitter, then the base has a positive voltage and the collector has to have an even higher positive voltage because the higher positive voltage on the collector than the base is what forces that second diode between the base and collector to be reverse biased. Transistors are amplifiers. They amplify current. And that's the most important property of a transistor, to amplify current. Transistors do not obey Ohm's law, but this does not mean that we cannot use Ohm's law when working on transistor circuits, because transistor circuits are going to have in resistors, and the resistors obey Ohm's law at all times. So even though the transistors themselves do not obey Ohm's law, when working on calculations with transistors, we have to use all the laws that we have already learned. Okay. Now, how about an example problem? For our transistor introduction, we will just use the transistor in its most common configuration, which is called common emitter because the emitter leg is shared by both the input and the output circuit. The input circuit is a low current circuit and the output circuit, which is amplified, is a high current circuit. There you see I have drawn a little circuit that shows how the transistor incorporates into two circuits. 
I've used two separate voltage sources, which is not normally used when the transistor is used in practice, but this allows you to see the high current output circuit, which is a 20 volt circuit going through the 10 kilo ohms and going through from the entire transistor from the emitter to the collector. And we, on the left hand side, we have a three volt source going through a 330 kilo ohm resistor through the base and emitter region only. And we can see clearly that the emitter leg is common to both circuits. So the base current, which is the one current flowing in the left hand circuit, and the collector current, which is flowing in the right hand circuit, are going to combine in that emitter leg. And it's important that we understand that. Okay, now we need to name the legs. Let us be per perfectly clear about these legs. You may have some mystery involved with these legs. They are E, B, and C, which stands for emitter, base, and collector. And uh, the transistor will have three leads or legs coming out of it. So you need to identify which is which in order to be able to connect the transistor properly into your external circuit. Now the relationship between the input and output current is very simple. There's the amplification factor beta, which simply multiplies the base current to get the collector current. And every transistor is going to have its own unique amplification factor, which is going to be the main characteristic that we would be concerned with when designing our circuits in this simple exercise. The best way to do, to pull it all together is with a problem. And uh, so I've drawn this little problem here, but I have uh, changed my mind. I've added, um, I've added a one more thing you have to find, which is the collector voltage. And I've actually changed the collector resistor from a 10K resistor to a 4.7K resistor. So there are the changes. We're finding three things, the base collector, current, base and collector current, the voltage at the collector, and uh, we are using the 4.7K resistor as our load, our collector resistor. So how do we start to even begin to do this problem? The first key to this problem is remembering that the voltage across a forward bias diode junction is always going to be 0.7 volts. Therefore, we are going to read approximately 0.7 volts between the emitter and the base at all times. No matter what currents are involved, that's going to be true. All right, so there's a circuit now that just shows the small current circuit, the input circuit by itself. We've left off the collector lead and we have the 20 volts because there's only one power source in this going through the 820K resistor with the 0.7 volt voltage drop across the forward bias diode uh, junction there in the transistor. Okay, so it's easy to work out the current in that loop. We simply uh, take away the 0.7 volts from the uh, 20 volts and the remaining voltage is sitting across the 820K resistor. So by Ohm's law, we have V over R and the result is 23.5 microamps for the base current. Since uh, the collector current now is only 100 times that, because our beta is 100 on this transistor that we're investigating, we just multiply it by 100, and that gives us a collector current 
of 2.35 milliamps. And finally, to get the collector voltage, again we use Ohm's law for the corrector collector resistor, realizing that the voltage dropped across the resistor is going to subtract from the 20 volts. So that is why it is shown like that. We have the 2.35 milliamp collector current being multiplied by the resistor, V equals IR. So the, that is the voltage across the collector resistor. That voltage will be, the 20 volts will be reduced by that amount. So at the end of the problem, we have 8.96 volts across the collector. I hope you're benefiting from this. Thanks for watching the Stephen Mendes channel and particularly this electronic series. Please, if you have questions or comments, I will be glad to help and I will be glad to incorporate any changes that you might recommend in future videos. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video.